Hello everybody, this is James Chai and I am doing my live broadcast for uh, for, <laughs> for today. I'm just trying to remember what episode I'm, I'm doing at. Okay, so uh, today is November 6, 2019, episode number 33, and I have put in the uh, vlog notes uh, exactly what I will be talking about today, and today's topic will be why dogs lift their leg to pee. And so it's to understand that psychological behavior that's happening. A lot of times we're hearing certain types of things about why the dog pees and, and you know, because they're marking territory, etc., etc., but it's actually a lot deeper than that, psychologically speaking. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Rita. Uh, so it's a lot more psychologically involved in that case when it comes to a dog that is peeing and lifting up their leg, etc. And um, so I'm going to go over that. But again, if you look in the description, you'll see the pre-notes and you'll have a good idea of what's going on there. Uh, I'm going to make an adjustment to my format as I proceed forward. And um, in the beginning of every description of my vlog is going to be about uh, people who've worked with me or if you haven't worked with me, is that when it comes to uh, training your dog, no matter who you went to, no matter what you've learned, if you ever have issues with your dog, always go back to square one. That's the most important thing that you can do is to go back to square one, go back to your basics. It's the keep it simple uh, um, situation. Sorry, I've got this kind of odd lighting thing that's going on. Ah, there we go, that odd lighting. Okay, so I'm going to try to do that. Sorry, just uh, maybe that's, yeah, no, no, that's even worse. Okay, so I'm going to put that back up there. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, so um, let me just figure this out. And uh, I'm excited also, before I go on, I'm, I should say I'm super excited. I just ordered a bunch of equipment um, to start doing my podcast and do a better quality vlog as well. So I've ordered a new camera, video camera, uh, a boom, a microphone, a whole bunch of other things as well. A new laptop, so all that's going to show up by the middle of this month to the end of this month. It's going to be a pretty big step for me. Thank goodness for credit cards, but it's a pretty big step for me to kind of go forward and make this uh, a much more enjoyable experience for everybody who is tuning in and checking out what I'm doing. Um, I, I got to say, I, I'm pretty happy with the stuff that's going on my YouTube channel, having a lot more people who are subscribing now. So I'm up to like 469 uh, followers on YouTube and hopefully I'll get to a thousand. And I think once I hit a thousand subscribers, I'm going to wear a suit that day. So um, I'm, I'm, it's going to be pretty, pretty cool, pretty exciting to do that. And uh, the quality of the video will improve. The podcast format will improve as well. Uh, or the vlog format will improve as well, and I'm going to try to uh, understand exactly what everyone out there wants to know what's going on and how I've learned what I'm doing. So um, just bear with me as things go along, but I'm so excited um, just to step into this incredibly new venture, which is a bit daunting uh, for somebody who has no experience prior to it. I have had the reliance and the, the, the kind, constructive, uh, comments and criticisms on what I'm doing for my vlog and so I'm working towards improving all that stuff so uh, it's gonna be great as I go forward and uh, uh, yeah so uh, so remember again you know just the first basic part is anytime you have issues always go back to square one with training doesn't matter who you've gone to for training go back to square one if you were told to you know just work with a sit stay aspect of it then it's a sit and stay you do the basics, doesn't matter if you're treat training or you're not treat training, go back to basics. If you have a dog that is re reactive or aggressive and you're finding that suddenly your dog is no longer uh, uh, complying or, or being, you know, uh, uh, listening to you, go back to square one. It all goes back to the same part. Just go back to your foundational aspects of it. Biggest thing to remember is if your dog has made progress and has not been reactive and then suddenly they seem as if they are making um, some sort of, you know, what you call two, one step forward, two step backwards or regressing or whatever you want to call that name, it's actually wrong. And it's your dog hitting a plateau. And that's it. And you got to recognize the fact that even if it is a plateau uh, for your dog to tolerate things in an environment where they previously would not have tolerated it means that they're plateaued and that you need to go back to square one to advance and progress your dog again. That's all. It's a really simple thing. We're kind of impatient as a uh, species. You know, we've got this internet thing that's going on and the technology and we send a text and we expect a response back in four seconds. And so when it comes to this whole part of it, 
it is just go back to square one, be patient. It takes a lifetime to get over PTSD for a human being. And we're asking our dog who doesn't have the cognitive ability in a sophisticated manner to get through that. So again, go back to square one. I just want to remind people that nobody talked to me about this today, uh, but I just want to remind people and all that. Hey, thanks, Christina. And I will be seeing you and Shannon on Friday uh, with uh, Pepper and with uh, hopefully you'll be bringing your dog Denver and your kids. Um, and we'll do that and we'll talk about uh, Christina and uh, Shannon um, and I think uh, Karma. Uh, we're all talking about setting up a, a time where I can do a coffee meet and greet with people and just, uh, you know, people can talk about it. Uh, yeah, that's true, Christine. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so it's a part of just getting back to, um, you know, having a, a, a Q&A for people who want to ask questions and it's going to be free and it's just uh, uh, something that's going to happen. So it's up to you, Christina, to get that going now because you're the one who um, has been uh, reminding me to do it. So I'm going to do that and uh, I'm going to start dressing a little bit nicer. I think. I'm using this uh, uh, awful hair gel that starts to dry out and flake and my gosh, with black hair. It looks like dandruff, and I'm just constantly like, so now I'm wearing baseball caps more often than I should. Hi, Kim. Hello, Blossom. Hello, River. I hope the two little doggies and Luke, the cat, you're all doing great, Kim. Um, I hope that River is not being as rambunctious as she is. River is so cute. This, this small little dog from Indonesia that uh, Kim rescued. Uh, Blossom is so uh, so adorable, but and, and Blossom is a small bulldog. Right, Bulldog, right? And and believe it or not, River is actually smaller than Blossom. And it's, it's, she looks like she's a puppy. So, uh, Kim, uh, so gorgeous. Um, okay, so I'm going to go and get right to the part of it. I'm going to talk about my vlog. And the vlog topic today is why, in brackets, dysfunctional dogs lift their legs to pee. And, uh, you know, so we, we do see a lot of information out there on the Internet that they're talking about why dogs lift their leg to go pee. That they um, that they will oh sorry bull terrier and non flaking hair gel okay um, I have to get some hair gel from your your teenager son then or yeah son I would guess because most women don't most girls don't use hair gel um, okay so um, a lot of the information out there in regards to why dogs are peeing on on things and items and all that stuff they're talking about the dominant behavior they're talking about this aspect of why the dog's doing because they're you know marking their territory and all that stuff. And that's a very simplistic approach to see it. And it's just is because the industry, the psychology, the academia out there does not fully recognize and understand dogs on the codependency and the psychological issues. Because they don't understand that, they start conjecture, uh, they start conjecture and then they start fantasizing about what that may mean. And they think it's a dominant aspect, which is why we are rooted in the points of alpha and, you know, uh, aggressive and so forth like that. Most times that is completely incorrect and we go on that part because the dogs are overt codependent. They rely on us to protect them and if there's any aspects of insecurity or whichever, then it causes our dog to behave dysfunctionally. Just like a human being, if we have a problem that's bothering us, had a bad nightmare that was really disturbing, woke up, up in the middle of the night, it's going to affect us for the rest of the day. So. And, and I'm talking about this because I'm I'm still going to finish this article about do dogs dream about us when your dog has a nightmare. So I'm going to roll into that. But why dogs pee is not a dominant behavior. It is a dysfunction behavior when it comes to a frequency. You know, the dog is peeing every once in a while. That's fine. But when a dog is peeing constantly and stopping to pee and, and they're, they're no longer even have anything left in their bladder and they're still peeing, that's a dysfunction. If you notice the fact that when your dog is at home and you're inside, indoors, your dog's hanging out with you and you take them outside to go pee after four or five, six hours, they can go pee and they pee and they come running back in. They don't pee and then pee here and then pee all over the place unless they have a serious dysfunction. Uh, my dog mostly pees with all fours on the ground, but if he's near a tree or a post, does he lift uh, Does he lift to mark over other dogs' scent? And actually, that's in my description, uh, Christina. So it's awesome that you're asking that. So we'll get to that in a, in a bit as you'll see that part of it. Uh, I won't be talking about why dogs pee on top of each other's pee today. This topic is quite expansive. And this is actually just a first part because then there's going to be parts about, well, why uh, another part of the topic I'll be uh, discussing is when your dog goes outside, why do they want to come back in? When you want them to go pee, they go run around and they come back inside. 
And that's a misinterpretation of behavior that is a misguided uh, presentation by the humans. So that's another topic that I'll be talking about. Um, I'm going to start expanding out on my topics. Uh, the, the problem for me has been that I see things so quickly. I'm seeing dogs at two tenths of a second. The behavior, I, I perceive their quantum behavior in, in just a matter of, uh, of just two tenths of a second. So then I have to sort of figure out how to humanize it and simplify it, I guess, uh, because I can't. When I, and anyone, you know, um, Christina, you know, your friend Karma, as well as Shannon and anyone, Kim, same thing with you. You know, when I was working with your dogs, it was just boom, boom, boom. This is what's wrong. And this is how you fix it. Boom, boom, boom. And then within seconds, you're like, oh, what? I don't understand any of it. And then we spend the rest of the session while I start to humanize it so that it makes sense for you. Um, so on this case here, for me to really slow it down when dogs pee, I understand the expansiveness of the, the definition of the topic. It just is going to take a while. Okay, so to the vlog topic itself, why does functional dogs lift their legs to pee? Yeah, yeah, and there's lots of things. You got to see the stream, uh, the, the the strength of the dog's pee, a whole bunch of things. You got to see if it smells sometimes, whether or not they're holding their urine too long, just like somebody who's going out hiking or mountaineering. And if you don't pee often enough or you drink enough water, then your urine gets a, a stronger smell or coloration to it. Same thing with dogs. And that's another dysfunction that is, see, like I say, this is a huge topic, huge. So you can imagine when I talk about things about how dogs process time or how dogs process pain, that is a topic that will take days and days of discussion um, as I simplify it. Okay, so um, one of the important things when your dog is going pee is making them feel safe when they're going pee or pooing. You want to make sure that your dog is feeling safe. And I put some links in my description as to why dogs pee inside the home, uh, about dogs seniority wise and about addressing dogs when they are peeing and or pooing. So that'll be in the links as well. So I'm going to briefly talk about the things and do a reference to it but I won't stick on it too far, too long on it because it's just, it's there, you can watch it. Um, so you wanna make sure that you can keep your dog safe when they're peeing, pooing when they're going out to the backyard. And I talked about this before that, um, you know, as long as the area is secure, you stick your head out, you look outdoors, you make the, the visual impact to look outdoors to make sure, okay, there's nobody out there, there's no danger when my dog goes pee, your dog sees that. And I have five dogs here, so they all see me looking around, making sure that the outdoors, the backyard is safe. And that backyard is is fenced. It's six foot fencing on it. The, it's temporary fencing that I had put up. Um, uh, my friends Debbie and Mike uh, uh, helped me put it up, and um, they know it's safe. And generally, there's no escape out of it, so th there's no way that they can get out. Which means they also know that if they can't get out, means that predators can't get in. Bad people can't get in. Your dog knows the area is safe and if you notice your dog when they do go pee outside in the backyard for those of you who have a backyard or you know a common area that the dogs are allowed to go pee you will notice that your dog most dogs don't pee frequently all over the place they pee in certain areas comfort areas right like comfort food comfort areas and then they'll go off and they'll some dogs dysfunctional wise may kick up dirt Right when they either do the back paws or they'll try to do the front paws or they'll do a successive aspects of front and back paws dysfunctions. These are all dysfunctional aspects of levels of confidence and security. So again, all this, like I say, going peeing, it's just not a simple thing. Going peeing is a very in-depth dysfunction that um, we want to understand for our dog that has issues. Okay, so you want to keep your dog safe when they're going pee or poo and you want to maintain eye contact with your dog. The one thing that is really difficult, like for example, I have uh, William and Anthony. Anthony is 19 months, up for adoption. He's 160 pounds, 160, 160 pounds. And William is about three and a half years old. He's from Mexico, uh, from Forever Free. And he is about 110 pounds. He's a smaller dog. Anthony loves to harass every single dog. He loves to chase them all down. He uses his weight and pushes them around, but he's playing around. He doesn't realize his size. Him and William get along really well, but Anthony will start really being quite belligerent to him at times, and especially when William is going pee. And William will be standing there going pee, and you can see him going pee. All the other dogs know he's going pee, and Anthony will run up to him and knock him over while he's going pee and sometimes poo. 
it is the simple fact that the dog feels unsafe when they're going peer poo. If they're being approached by, you know, if William's being approached by Anthony, he's going to feel really nervous because if Anthony's just walking around while, while William's going pee, in William's head, he knows Anthony's going to come over and, and barrel over him and knock him over while he's still going pee. So then sometimes I will have to call Anthony out or call William out their name, maintain eye contact. Sometimes I'll walk over to William when he's going pee while I'm keeping eye contact on Anthony. What I'm doing is I'm addressing the potential threat to William's safety while he's going pee. I'm acknowledging the dogs by saying their names, letting Anthony know that I'm watching him, that if he is going to be a jerk to, to William, that I'm going to interrupt. And there's times where I've had to physically step in or you know, give uh, Anthony a, a bit of a clunk on the, on the body to keep him away from William because he wants to throw 160 pounds at William and it's just not cool. And it makes William afraid for his own safety in the sense of, I can't even go pee without this crazy Anthony trying to knock me over. It's the same aspect for a dysfunctional dog inside a safe area or outside the yard in the sense that is Minky playing with an empty con food container. Um, my fault, I made sure everything was safe, so I apologize for the noise in the background. Um, so uh, it it's a part of just making William feel safe whenever... Minky? Uh, it's a part of making William feel safe when he's going pee. And so again, I I've got to interrupt Anthony's boisterous behavior as he tries running over to him. I've got to make sure that I have to physically stop Anthony from knocking William over. And now I'm at the point where I can just say Anthony's name and William will pee. William will watch me. And I talked about this in, and you'll see this in some of the other vlogs in the playlist that I've listed. William will watch me go pee. I mean, I'm, I will watch William go pee. And he's making sure that I'm keeping an eye on Anthony. So by William making eye contact with me, he's making sure that I'm making sure that the entire perimeter, the area around William is going to be safe. And we want to make sure that that's the case because if not, William's not going to go pee. And as I talked about another topic, William may just decide to come back inside the, inside the house. So it's that part of, again, interrupting anything that Anthony is doing to keep William safe. So when you're outdoors and you're walking with your dog, think of William, think of Anthony. Think of the fact that your dog, if they're dysfunctional, they're afraid of being attacked while they're going pee. And let's face it, if we go pee, Minky! If, if, uh, sorry, I'm going to pull this out of the way. No Minky. Sorry, i got to get this garbage out of the way. This is what Minky was eating. It's uh, vegan chicken nuggets. And uh, they're actually really good. These vegan chicken nuggets are amazing. Um, anyhow, uh, so when you're walking with your dysfunctional dog outdoors, Make sure that you make eye contact with your dog when they're peeing. Make sure that you look to your left, to your right, back and forth. Make eye contact with your dog. When you're looking to the sides, make sure that you're saying your dog's name while you're looking around so that they know you're keeping them safe. And those of you who have been following my vlog understand that. If you don't understand it, the links are in, uh, in the description here. There are the times when you have more than one dog. Like myself, I have five dogs. So when they run out, I let them out of the door, into the backyard, one at a time, based on seniority. So, for example, I would let, uh, um, you know, um, I'm going to use the names that I've used before. So I'm going to use Zevia. Zevia is going to be the senior dog. So Zevia will be allowed out first, and then it will be, um, what's the other dog's name? What is the other, uh, the, and then there will be Johnson. Johnson will be the second dog that goes out, and I'll close the door, and Johnson runs out, then I'll call Richard over, I'll open the door, Richard will go out, I'll close the door, and then Robert's turn next, I'll open the door, then Robert will go out. And I'll be in this order for the dogs so that they understand seniority from in the home. And I've talked about seniority and that link is in my vlog description. And then the dogs go outside. And if I see the dogs going pee, I'm going to call out their names in the order they're going pee. Not in the order of seniority, but in the order the dogs have gone pee as well. So they can run out and some of the dogs won't pee right away. They'll be like, ah, oh, I'm just running around and smelling everything and seeing what raccoons have been in the yard or wolves, I mean, or coyotes, I mean, because the area is full of coyotes. I'll look around and all that stuff, I might go pee. So then I will acknowledge the first dog to go pee. So if, if it's not, if it's say, for example, Johnson that goes pee instead of Zevia, then I'll say Johnson and then it's Zevia, then it's Zevia, 
then Richard, then Robert, I will make that notification to all of them because then what I'm doing is I'm acknowledging which dog is going pee first in order of seniority and that way the dog who's gone pee first is going to feel exposed to the elements, to the danger, etc. You can do the same thing when you're walking with more than one dog, dog walker, same thing like that. Pay attention to which dog goes pee, acknowledge them as they're going pee, look around and that'll make your dog feel safe. And it's a beautiful thing because it builds bonding, it builds trust, it builds connection. It's your dog knowing that their human has their back. That we are watching out for any danger in case something happens. So that's something that's super important that you want to do. Um, so acknowledge your dogs as well. Um, now, why do dogs lift their legs to go pee? The smaller dogs don't necessarily lift their legs to go pee because they're kind of short. And uh, I'm sorry, the smaller dogs will lift their legs to go pee sometimes because they're kind of short. The bigger dogs will lift their legs to go pee. Why? It's not a dominant aspect of it. Uh, should our dogs go out the door before us or after? If you're just letting them, uh, Deborah, if you're letting your dog go out pee to pee, then um, you don't have to go out the door. But if you're going out for a walk, then you go out first. Uh, what I should say too, and I, and I forgot to do this, I wrote this all down in my vlog, podcast notes and, and tips and all that stuff. Um, I'm going to answer some of the questions at the end of this. So, you know, in about 15, 20 minutes, I should be finished. And then we can open up for some questions or anything that you want to ask relative, relatable to dogs going pee. Um, okay, so uh, so so, the, so some dogs, like the, I have Great Danes. And I also have, you know, Minky the Jindo that um, is supposed to be going back to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Uh, but the Danes lift their legs to go pee when they first come here. And then over time, they stop lifting their leg to go pee because they feel safe. The other aspect of it is why, right? It's not a dominant aspect for most dogs. It's not an alpha aspect for most dogs. It's a hygiene reason for dogs to lift their legs to go pee, especially male dogs. You see female dogs, They uh, and I'll get to that part about some female dogs lifting their legs, but if you notice female dogs squat to go pee because of their genitalia, but they, they do so. Male dogs do so because the pee will splash on the ground, on the grass, on the pavement, and splash back onto their legs, onto their fur. So what happens then? Well, when your dog in the wild, primitive, etc., that pee on their leg will track them back by predators back to where they're going. If the pee's on your fur, right? I mean, not your fur, but your dog's fur, wild dog, walking through the forest, walking through wherever it is, running back, high, high, whatever it is, if they've got urine on their fur, it's going to brush off onto the rest of the plants and bushes and so forth. That's going to allow predators to track them back. They're going to allow predators to track your dog back to their home, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, an aspect of one is self-preservation, instinct of survival. And the second part is hygiene, right? We see our dogs always licking themselves. They're always cleaning themselves. They're cleaning their paws and all that stuff because they have urine on it. You have a mom, uh, a female dog with puppies. She licks their uh, her dogs and eats the licks and eats the pee and poo and all that stuff in the beginning etc right cleans their dog because you don't want to have the urine stains etc but they do it for hygiene so when your dog is going to pee on the fur they're going to smell that when they're home they're going to track that they're going to clean themselves off etc etc and it's an anxiety driven issue sometimes as well when that happens and that goes back to the dysfunction and for the dog and that again is a different aspect of it so uh so um we go on to that part and then, then if you notice that too as well when the dogs are going pee and people say oh well you know dogs peeing to mark their territory they lift their leg to pee on the lamp post or whatever it is most dogs don't actually hit their target when they pee none of my dogs do and they're danes and minky the jindo uh, they never hit their target when they're trying to pee on it they have no idea uh, proximity wise relational wise where the, the lamp post or the tree is and they end up peeing on the side of it or I mean not on the side they pee off to the edge away from it they never even hit it half the time that's the other part of it um, after a length of time they eventually end up squatting because again they feel safe they're not worried about it but when they're outdoors they're going to be peeing against these things and it's why why are they peeing against these things even if they don't hit it and people say again you know the taller the bigger the dog and all that stuff and it's going to help the 
you know what? It's kind of a silly, um, immature uh, observation uh, saying that the dogs peeing there to, to, to mark their territory as in a dominant behavior. Yes, they may be putting their scent down in a familiar perimeter of the area that they are always walking around and all that stuff. If you're a predator or prey, the last thing you're going to do is leave a sign of where you are. You're not going to mark territory so you can be tracked. So it's not an alpha thing. It is a dysfunction on the per, per predominant majority of dogs. So I just debunked that part of the alpha aspect, the dominant aspect of peeing on things for the dog to be, you know, it isn't because, my gosh, the dog is going to track going to be tracked by their own urine uh, uh, signs and all that stuff. So it's, it's like I say, it's a bit silly on that part of it. Um, and again, why do they lean up again, or not lean up, why do they go up against a, a telephone pole or a tree or even a signpost? You see dogs who are, you know, like a Great Dane, a Mastiff, a, a, a Great Pyrenees, a St. Bernard, and they're like as wide as the screen is, and then they go up to this little lamp post that's like this wide compared to them, and they go to pee on it, right? It's a safety aspect. That leaves your dog exposed only on three sides instead of four. So the side that they're peeing on is now covered by that lamp post. And if you watch the dogs when they pee against that lamp post, they're not looking in the same direction of the lamp post that they're peeing on. They're looking everywhere else. They're looking to us, right, for the acknowledgement. They're looking around. They're never, almost never looking in the area where they're peeing against. It's a safety aspect. They create a barrier. They create that part where they feel safe. And they're like, okay, cool. I can pee now. I'm not going to get an attack from this side, but I have to keep an eye on this side and watch my owner and watch to see if my owner's eyes, my human's eyes, exhibit any aspect of fear or caution in regards to the environment. So there we go on that part as well. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, uh, what's the next one here is... Um, Okay, yeah, so dogs pee against something for safety, right, to protect them against the, the aspect of it. And it's obviously, you know, they talk about the part of tracking sense, right, when the dog pees on there and allows everyone, you know, all the other dogs in the neighborhood to know where they are and, and so forth like that. You know, the thing is, if a dog is peeing here, so, so, so here's a pole, right, here's a pole, and the dog is peeing here, a small little dog, oh, sorry, here on the ground, right, so the dog is peeing here or peeing here, okay, right, you, the people talking about dominant aspect of it, alpha, all that stuff. Okay, so, you know, you can talk maybe, you know, on a Great Dane, you're talking 20 inches above versus a dog, you know, a Chihuahua, right, two inches and etc. Here's the thing. The sensitivity, the hypersensitivity of every dog's nose, it doesn't matter to them. They're going to smell it no matter what. If it's up here, if it's down here, if it's above them, they're going to smell it. Do you, do you see what I mean, right? Because what's happened is uh, academia has looked at <laughs> at dogs as if they're just dumb. And then what academics have done, PhD, behaviors and all that stuff, they've looked at dogs and the aspect, oh, okay, anthropom anthropomorphizing our conjecture of behavior onto the dog. We're making these liberal assumptions that that's why it's happening. But really, dog ping up here, dog ping down there. They're just going to walk. They're going to smell it as they're approaching it anyways. It doesn't mean anything. They're going to smell it. They're just going to like, okay, well, whatever, right? Because it's, it's relational to size and height is not a big thing. But it's just like they're going to smell it. So it's not, like I say, it, it doesn't matter where the dog pees. They're going to miss the pole, right? They're going to pee past it. They're going to, none of it, it's not an alpha thing, okay? It's a dysfunctional aspect. It's a security aspect, and I'll get to that later on here. Okay, so I talked about it, um, you know, uh, peeing on, them, on their own fur against aspects like you'll see even a dog that will pee especially a big dog that has a lot of urine and they'll pee and they'll stop peeing and they'll move forward a little bit or else they'll kind of raise their leg and change their body position while they're peeing because they know from historical experience that the pee is pooling on the ground on the floor and it will start to seep onto their other leg or i mean onto their other paw and or splash up onto their fur. And you'll see your dog starting to readjust their position while they're still peeing or they'll move forward and, re and pee somewhere else, which is a similar aspect of dogs going poo. 
All right. So um uh yeah. So anyhow, um let's go on to the next one about the drag uh, tracks the dog's own scent. A lot of times when your dog is walking around in a neighborhood, you'll see your dog peeing in the same areas, or they'll pee peeing frequently. It's an insecurity aspect of the dog, or a low self esteem issue, or a dependency issue, a self identity issue, an OCD issue. Aspects that your dog is doing by peeing frequently to self soothe their anxiety. They don't know how to deal with it otherwise. They're insecure, for example, about being outdoors. They're nervous, skittish, and they're going to just pee here. They're going to pee everywhere because not only are they trying to just establish the perimeter, they're trying to establish their self-identity in the area that they're not comfortable in. By peeing often enough, they make themselves feel safe. There. Make sense? Logic. I've seen this with all the dogs that I've worked with. Extremely dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs, as people know. I've worked with dogs that have uh, that are 180 plus pounds, 180 plus pounds. Dragged a shelter worker into his kennel, inflicted wounds requiring 42 stitches. Dogs that have dragged people off couches, giant dogs that have dragged people off couches onto the floor, inflicting wounds requiring 67 stitches. Dogs that have attacked me as well. All these parts of it, when you start to drill down to the dysfunction of the dog. It all makes sense. So review all the stuff that I've talked about in regards to dogs urinating and peeing and all stuff, and you will find that it all makes sense because I'm seeing the dogs as a sentient being functional in the sense of why and what are they doing in each and every single behavior of theirs. Um, and, and in the rest of my notes here, I talk about large dogs that would normally pee and lift their leg to pee. When they're in the backyard, in my backyard, they end up squatting, as I said earlier, when the dogs are outdoors, watch your dog outdoors, outside of the safety of their yard. They lift their leg to pee. Especially for Dane owners, Mastiffs, Great Pyrenees, uh, Afghans, all that kind of stuff, right? You will see that your dog will squat in the backyard where they feel safe. And then when you take them outdoors, they don't squat anymore because they don't feel safe. Alpha, dominant, just debunked all of that. All right? Um, and then now we'll get to the other part of it here is Zevia, right? Zevia is a female dog and she will, people will say, I have a female dog and my female dog lifts her leg to go pee. It is a conscious cognitive behavior of a above average functioning dog, either a dysfunctional aspect or a cognitively functional dog. That behavior of mimicking, of identifying of aligning by being, you know, if I do what you do, I'm part of your group. That part of it as well. Uh, okay, I'll uh, my okay. I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, Kelly. Just remind me here. Um, so then that's what ends up happening. Okay, so the female dog lifts her leg to go pee, and I I I, I checked out this stuff on Google, and I'm looking at some of these little uh, academia academia papers put up by some universities and all that stuff, and it's just really ridiculous because they're they're saying like, oh, it's the female dog is being dominant. No, people, female dog's not being dominant. All she's doing, all Zivi is doing, is I it's it's being part of the group. She wants to do what the other dogs are doing. It's a dependency issue. It's a low self-esteem sometimes on that issue. And watch the way a female dog pees. Their body position is not the same. Their head is not held the same way. And I've read, read articles where they said, oh, you know, the dog's the same position. No, because you're not paying attention to the little nuances at the couple of millimeters of animal behavior. They're not seeing all these things. So when the female dog is going pee, She's not actually doing it the same way as a human dog, uh, sorry, a male dog is because her head position is not held up in a certain way and her leg is not held up in the same way. So she's mimicking. And why is that, that the female dog pees with her leg up differently than the male dog that pees with their leg up? Because, all right, so are you ready? Here's another thing to, to blow it all away. It's because the female dog does not have a penis. So when you know the floppy penis and all that stuff, right? So when the female dog is going pee, well, sorry, when the male dog is going pee, they angle it up, right? So they don't splash themselves, right? So they don't track it in all, all I said. And then the penis is on an angle, so it pees out. The female dog without having the penis, right? I don't know how to do the female dog. I'm not going to do the female dog. Um, well, I have to, I guess, for visual. The female dog doesn't have the penis to understand the trajectory, the physics 
of her behavior. She does not have the calculus of the behavior because she doesn't have the object to, uh, objects, which is the penis. So she doesn't understand the concept of, well, the reason why the male dogs are leaning over is to aim their penis out to pee. The female dog only mimics what she's seen out of the dependency, the dysfunction that she has, low self-esteem, and she squats down normally, but she goes and does that sideways. And if you notice that, her leg is not even lifted up barely off the ground, and otherwise it's over-exaggerated dysfunction, right? Okay, so we'll go on that part. So again, it's a conscious decision by the female dog to do so, and that's where it all, anyways, okay. So I'm gonna just end this off now. I just wanna say, uh, if people who have questions, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions that I see, and then um, we'll continue this on for the next day. So Kelly, uh, she says, you say, um, uh, mine's a little Yorkie rescue, she's not safe. Uh, okay, so what does what does, uh, what does does your Yorkie do, right? Does she squat down? Does she keep looking around? Does she pee kind of frantically in the sense of she pees a little bit and she runs off a little bit and then she digs her, her paws into the ground? Those are the kind of questions that dysfunction will answer by understanding the dog's dysfunction. Nope, it's not low. Um, no, you didn't. <laughs> Barely lifted her leg in all sense. So that's gonna that may indicate Kelly that you're you're a uh, barley or what's her name? Um, but that may indicate Kelly that your Yorkie is feeling unsafe, insecure, at threat, being outdoors, and that she doesn't want to make an overt aspect of it. But if she's uh, right, so that's her gonna gonna be her behavior, and why is she lifting up her leg, um, barely to do so. She's trying to feel safe. She's trying to be part of the group. It, it depends on. I don't know enough detail um, uh, of what's going on. But it, if she's squatting with her leg a little bit lifted up, she's trying to imitate or mimic that part of it. Um, hopefully, you know, I'll be up here on Wednesday. To, uh, sorry, th Friday to do my vlog again to follow through. And okay, Annie lifts her leg and stares straight. She goes. And then walks, and then goes again, and, and then air, then pees up in the air again. Is that is that what you mean? Uh, Annie lifts her leg and stares straight ahead. Okay, so she goes, and then she and then walks, and then goes again, and then, and then air pees. So I I'm wondering if she digs into the ground at all when she pees, etc. Right? Um, so so she might just be somewhat. Um, yeah, it would actually be a bit of a self confidence issue on her end. If she's staring straight ahead and she's not checking in, um, I, I haven't done a video on separation anxiety, Daniel. Um, yeah, Kelly, you know, feel free to uh, um, go through that. Thank you, Deborah. Feel, uh, Kelly, feel free to, um, you know, I'll be up on Friday to do a, a bit more, which is why some dogs won't pee and they come right back inside the home. And when you find out why, you're just going to be like, really? Really? I'm, we, us humans, we're that dumb? <laughs> Right? Because it's all these little behaviors that I have to study on my own aspects when I'm interacting with these dogs that are predators. Because if I don't, then I'm going to get attacked and I'll get fatally, most likely fatally injured. Um, and got to got to go on my wits. It's, fun. it's interesting. Um, uh, you know, the, the separation anxiety one is actually there's something in one of my links in my description, Daniel, regards to why some dogs pee inside the home. It's a separation aspect of it. It's a low, a lot of things, but you can watch that part. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, uh, oh, okay. Well, Kelly, does she pee before, has she peed before she goes outside? If she hasn't peed, it goes outside, then that means that she has a social uh, dysfunction. And that that is in the sense that her ability to socialize with other dogs is dysfunctional in that sense, which then comes not from a low self-esteem, but it's a lack of self-confidence, which is what I kind of was intimating uh, previously a few minutes ago here. Um, and, and thank you for reminding me, Deborah. I do have a GoFundMe page. I do have a Patreon page. Both those fundraisers are meant to raise funds to go towards providing free well to providing dog training to people on fixed income so uh the links are in my description you can uh go ahead and check it out if you can donate a couple of bucks that'd be great it does go to help fellow dog owners who you know who who may be making minimum wage allow them to afford to to get some dog training because i do know people who have said to me you know my rates are uh, are are still a little bit tough for them to manage and sometimes I, you know usually i give people a break who who are honest with me about stuff like that but um let me just go roll up there my dog pees in multiple mostly repetitive places in the yard three to four times each time we go outside three four uh 
Yeah, he. You know what? When I meet Denver, uh, Christina, on Friday with uh, Shannon and Pepper, then you'll uh, we can talk about that. And, and, and if you do what I just tell you to do in regards to acknowledging Denver all the time and 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 making the eye contact and all that, you'll see it's it's gonna make sense, and he'll stop doing it. Uh, she doesn't dig into the ground, Kelly. Okay, yeah. So it's gonna be a self confidence issue. I have a male who's confront, confrontational with the rest of the pack. He needs to be separated. When he goes into common area, he searches where others go and pees there. You know what's really interesting about that part, Kathleen, is that it means that he has a high codependency issue, if not an interdependency issue, which means that he gets a bit clingy to his humans. And um, yeah, because let's read it again. I have a male who's confrontational with the rest of the pack. He needs to be separated. When he goes into the common area, he searches where other... I went and pees there too as well. And that's, you know, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, Kathleen, just say your dog's name. Say his name as he's going around when he's going to go pee. Make the acknowledgement before he approaches the area that other dogs have peed. And just keep doing that repeatedly. Uh, like, don't say it repeatedly. I mean, just do it every time he goes out to pee and you see him doing that. It's it's kind of that part of it. It is a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a above average codependency issue. And I talk about these things, right? And it makes sense when we talk about dogs being codependent because how do they cohabitate with us? Cross species, cohabitating over 10,000 plus years. Emotional isomorphism is my coined term of the two different genetic structures that have uh, evolved parallel to each other and sharing common traits, which is the emotional aspect of, you know, overt codependency, covert codependency for humans, overt codependency for uh, for dogs. Um, so so that's part. Just let me get through the rest of this. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yes, I believe it is. I was hoping you would say that. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Low, low self-confidence. Okay. What about donation for your equipment? Um, um, you, you know, Deborah. Uh, so I've already, uh, and I appreciate you mentioning that, I've, uh, I've ordered the stuff. Uh, it's like only like two grand worth of equipment that I'm ordering on my credit card. Like I say, thank goodness for credit cards. Um, uh, I know people, who, somebody who's giving me some advice who had uh, her own own podcast. I think she spent like over $10,000 on her. Like I'm spending like $150, $130 on a microphone. She spent like $700 on one microphone and she bought more than one. And, and she had this, uh, uh, she, it was quite a successful podcast that she had actually was, uh, uh, was listened to in over 19 countries. And it was a, a brilliant concept, but she just kind of, did it for uh, um, uh, just an incredible um, uh, frame of time. But anyhow, um, so yeah, you know, you, if you want to help me uh, donate to my uh, to my equipment, to my vlog, to improve everything and all that stuff, it would be great. I would really appreciate it. You can do it through my um, GoFundMe page or my Patreon page as well. And you can just put in the notes, this money can go to the equipment, etc. I will be improving the quality of my vlogs. I'll be improving the podcast. You're going to hear my voice sound a lot different. It's going to actually sound not so teeny going through this, uh, through the phone and all stuff. Um, so we're going to go through that. Uh, Kelly, as you finish, and I'm going to finish this off uh, soon. Um, I got my rescue for free. Do you have anywhere I can inquire about a home visit? You visit my dad when he was fostering one through that rescue. Oh, which which dog was it that your dad uh, had? Um, yeah, which which one uh, do that? Um, I, I I I do offer uh, one and two hour sessions. My one hour session is one hundred sixty dollars. My two hour session is two hundred thirty dollars plus GST because we have to charge GST in this world. Anybody running a business. Uh, if you're through Forever Free, uh, I just need to know when you adopted your dog, and then I do provide a discount for people who have adopted. And it just, even though I don't have to, just I think it's just right. Um, and usually it's one session, right? So you can check out some of the stuff that I've done. Um, okay, Rocky, Rocky. Oh, it sounds familiar. I'm not sure when. Uh, what kind of dog was he, and when was that that happened? Uh, okay, so, um, all right, so um, maybe, you know, I'll be back online on Friday with another vlog, and I'll, um, I'll expand out on um, uh, on why some dogs won't pee and want to come back inside, or they, they won't poo, come back inside. Rocky, male aggressive. Yeah, I, I wish I knew which dog that was. Um, but, yeah, I apologize uh, for that. Uh, I'm not knowing. I'm just trying to scroll up here and, and check it all out. 
Okay, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to um, uh, ask me. You can um, you can post it in the comments section. Uh, go on to my YouTube channel. Uh, it would be great if you all could follow me on my YouTube channel. Like I say, I'm at 469. Uh, followers on YouTube. Once I get to a thousand, I'm going to put on a suit and do a broadcast, I think, from that way just to celebrate. I, um, but I'm just trying to get the word out of what I'm doing. And to, um, he was a great blackish small guy that wouldn't even let my dad in his own house. Oh, I don't, I don't recall. Yeah, I don't recall uh, this dog, Rocky, then, um, Kelly. I'm sorry. In um, I'm sure I got Annie's release now. Okay. Um, you know, you can you can email me at james at arfarfbarkbark.com. So that's my email address, james at arfarfbarkbark.com. Please send me clear photos of her eyes, face, and body so I can get a sense of her, right? And if you go to my website, arfarfbarkbark.com, and check out the tab that says Help for Your Dogs, you'll see where I've read people's dogs through just online through my Facebook group that I have. It's a closed group. Anyone can join it, but it's a closed group. And um, you'll see where I've read people's dogs from their photos and their descriptions, and that's it. And my accuracy, you'll, you'll see numerous numerous people have written on there. You'll you'll see that. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, please, Kelly, yeah, email me. Um, but you'll 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 see in the in the uh, reading on my uh, help for your dog tab on arfarfbarkbark.com. And you see testimonials, etc. But you'll see the accuracy and the proficiency of what I've done by reading simply the description and looking at the photos, because the description is reflective of the human being and the overall aspects of the environment and the issues. And then the dog's face and photos. Why I ask for photos, and every trainer and behaviorist asks for photos and 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 the name of your dog, which is why I ask for the name of your dog, because it allows me to get a sense of your dog by the way they look. And people go, oh, well, dog is just a dog. And, you know, and some of my colleagues are like, well, I don't need to see the dog's face. I just can tell you what the issue is. No, no, you can't. It's the same thing uh, when you go to adopt a dog for the first time in your life and you look at hundreds of pictures, right? Kim has done this. You've looked at hundreds of pictures of your dog, of the dog you want to adopt, 100, 200 photos of different dogs, different dogs, and you decided to pick just that one dog that you end up adopting, Kelly, because there's something in the photo of your dog that you're adopting, that, that dog that struck you emotionally. There's features, physical features, that struck you emotionally. Something, that connection. That's what I do when I look at your photos of your dog. To me, I fall in love with your dog. Codependency is about love. So I fall in love with your dog and I see everything that's going on. So then it's important that you send me information of what you're talking about in regards to the issues, uh, the history overall, but photos and uh, uh, description. And then I'll be able to read your dog and then we go from there. You know, the thing is I've had, you know, most of the, well, every single dog I've worked with uh, is, is just a median dog, like a dog that's like a four out of 10 on my scale. And, Every single dog, doesn't matter if they're like a, a 4 or 10, they have physical attributes in the ways their eyes are, the way they hold their mouth, the tongue is out in, in the way the picture's taken, the way they hold their body. Um, I think uh, um, uh, 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 Jennifer, who, who works at, um, at a pet store out in White Rock, I was able, hi Sue, I was able to read her dog, Annie, and tell them, uh, tell her and her husband that, Annie looks like she had either a severe trauma to her head, which was causing some seizures. They couldn't figure it out. She'd been to a neurologist, etc., and they couldn't figure it out. And also due to her back as well, that she may have had a fractured back because she came from a really horrific country. Um, that part, and then how sometimes Annie would fall down the stairs by just even, right? And I was able to work that out. And I might go on that part to discuss that. Actually, I'm going to put a note on that to discuss that after this one here for people who have older dogs, senior dogs, dogs with failing sight, and how to really just create a simple uh, procedure, simple thing that's going to cost you next to nothing, like two bucks, to help improve the confidence of your dog that has vision issues. And uh, people who know me know that I have worked with the most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America, right? Attacked 16 people in New York. 
uh, you know, over six feet, four inches standing on hind legs. He was beaten so badly by one person out of seven different homes he'd been through in 19 months that he was 20% blind, 10% hearing loss, and slight brain damage, which on itself, being a 180-plus pound dog, is already a death sentence. Uh, he had three kill orders put out on him, the third one being from the court of New York, uh, where he's not allowed back into the state of New York ever again or else he'll be killed. And then, like, over 100 people wrote letters to the judge to ask him to be sent to me and stuff like that. Um... And, you know, we, we want to make our dog feel safe and, and with his aspects of being partially blind and so forth like that, uh, I did a bunch of things. So I'll talk about that after my my vlog on Friday will be about why your dog goes outside and comes back in and goes outside and comes back in and goes outside and comes back in. You're just like, Rah! Hulk smash. And then after that, I'll talk about how to address a dog that has vision impairment issues or hearing impairment issues on on Monday. Um, it's going to be quite an expansive uh, topic in regards to dogs with vision issues and hearing impairment issues. So um, that may be a couple, three or four. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep it succinct. But um, uh, Sue, I hope your husband Don is doing okay and all that stuff. Um, you know, my greatest uh, um, support to you. And I hope uh, Momo, your little doggy, and, and the other dogs and the cat as well. I hope they're all doing really well. Um you know, and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that you have between you and your husband, uh, you know, as he um, uh, is dealing with these things, um, you, you guys are a, a, an example of true love. This incredible loyalty and true love that you have. And you know what, guys, everyone out there, this is what we all look for, right? Whether or not you're in a marriage or in a relationship with somebody, our ultimate dream is true love. Our dog is true love. Awesome, Sue. Our dog is true love. Our dog would give their life to defend ours in a heartbeat, without even thinking. That's loyalty. That's codependence. That's absolutely what his trust is all about. My dog's got my back. You've got my back, and etc. Um, oh wow, Mary. Um, uh, my uh, Mary writes. My dogs are. Uh, my dogs are um, going to be in a situation next week I'm bringing my mom home for her uh, as your mom uh, as your mom is uh, I guess terminal uh, Mary I'm sorry to hear that um, you know the, it'll be okay though your dogs will understand as long as it's not hyper emotional um, you know I have a topic about how to um, deal with death on the human side with our dogs and on our dog side with their own death and that's something that um, you know, it's going to take me a little while to get the uh, to get the personal strength to get up and talk about it because of uh, um, uh, you know, obviously those of you who know me. Um, anyhow, uh, as I, I try not to tear up here. Um, okay, so um, uh, let me just see here. Okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, don't forget, so it's true love that we look for. Um, it's true love that we're looking for when it comes to uh, our own relationships and the people in our life. We want that aspect where we know we can trust them implicit and they can trust us and we can forgive them for any of the errors that they have put on us and they will forgive us for the errors that we put on them. And that is forgiveness, that's trust. In the old days, you remember when people were married for 60 years? 50, 60, 70 years even, right? That's true love. They put, they went through everything. The worst of times, you know, some of them growing up, uh, when I was younger, I remember people who lived through the depression and stuff like that, um, through the war and everything. And, uh, you know, um, they were together with their spouse forever. They put up with stuff forever. And, you know, sometimes it would, they would just fall in love with just by writing letters to each other. Right in the old days before the internet, they would just write letters to each other. They would phone each other with a dial, rotary dial phone, and fall in love with each other. Nowadays, you know, I'm on Tinder and Bumble and all stuff, and it's just like, okay, back and forth, swipe, whatever, right? And it's so superficial, and there's no connection, and, and everyone's just looking for the next best thing. Uh, you know, if I, if I see this guy, maybe the next guy is the right guy or the, the perfect guy. I'm looking for true love, etc. kind of thing. When it comes to our dogs, 
we do the same thing when we're looking at the photos and we're like, okay, is this a photo of our dog that we really like and we want to adopt, uh, adopt her or not? Can we see this, you know, this thing in there, right? We want to fall in love. It's easier for us to fall in love with our dogs because our dogs are unconditional and everything they do is to a point forgivable, right? So it's an interesting world that we live in. Anyhow, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, for checking in and, and uh, zooming in on everything that's going on. Uh, I will be uh, posting this up on to my YouTube channel for a vlog as well. So those of you, again, if you can follow my YouTube channel, Arf, Arf Bark Bark Vid Dog Training, as well as follow me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Arf Arf Bark Bark. On my Facebook page, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation. I'm a registered nonprofit, just me, myself, and I, uh, trying to change the world for all the dogs. Now you understand why dogs pee and why it makes sense. And when you watch your dogs go pee, it's all going to make sense now. And it's not an alpha or dominant part, it's just basic logic. Yeah. Um, and as I'm transitioning forward to. Uh, uh, thank you, Sue. As I'm transitioning forward, to, uh, and as well, Christina, um, as I transition forward to making this much more of a professional, enjoyable aspect, I'll be doing podcasts. My podcast will be between 45 minutes to one hour. I'm going to keep that aspect. And I'm going to try to make it a bit more uh, enjoyable for everybody to understand. And, um, you know, maybe one of these days I can do some uh, viewers' questions as well and work with their dog in that regard. So I'm going to figure it all out. Thank you, everybody, so much. Have an incredible Wednesday. And, um, you know, be kind, do something nice for somebody that you normally wouldn't, which is to be tolerant of them an extra 15, 20 seconds. And that's it. Count to 20 in your head while they're telling you something that you don't want to hear because it's a, the rehash of the same thing. But, um, you know, be tolerant. Give, give somebody an extra 15 or 20 seconds of your time and then say thank you cool let's change the topic let's talk about something else let's do something else let's uh let's uh do that right it's like i say it's a it's a human aspect of psychology thank you so much everybody have a great night and uh you're welcome deborah bye-bye